welcome everybody. I'm Deborah Gallant from e for all which is Entrepreneurship for All. It's an inclusive entrepreneurship program that just launched here in Berkshire County in September of 2019. And we have had such a fantastic reception here. Um, I want to just start off by this panel was supposed to be how I built my business in the Berkshires. We were so excited. Berkshire Community College was going to make it into a forum. The students were going to come. It was going to be a small business gathering. We were all going to be on campus. Oh, and one Berkshire was going to buy us all a cup of coffee. And then we had COVID. So we felt like we had all these terrific people already committed to this morning. And even though we can't buy you a cup of coffee, hopefully you brought your own. Um, we thought, let's bring them all together and talk but we're gonna change the focus a little bit. The focus is gonna be how we're coping in the Berkshires. We still wanna do the how I built my business in the Berkshires, and we hope to do that in the fall and get on all of your schedules and make one Berkshire buy us all a cup of coffee. But in the meantime, we're gonna to have today, we only have an hour, we have amazing panelists. Um, I think most of you know what E4ALL is, but Casey would kill me. Casey, just uh, turn your video on for a second. Casey's the program manager for E4ALL. He also got both of the banners, so you can see his branding is much better than mine. Um, oh, Casey is helping coordinate our pitch contest on May 13th. And yes, we're gonna do it virtually. We're gonna, so if anyone, you know anyone who has a business idea, make sure they know about our pitch contest. There's cash awards to be had. Also, we run weekly webinars on different topics. I wanna hand it off, because I'm talking way too much, to Kevin Bouchard of Berkshire Community College, who's gonna be my co-host today. Kevin, welcome. You need to unmute yourself. You gotta love this. There you go. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone this morning and uh, thank you and all of our partners and our distinguished panel uh, for participating in this very important event today. Uh, we at Berkshire Community College uh, obviously have been impacted as, as well as our, our businesses, our community members, our uh, uh, educational partners, other organizations in our community. And we're looking to continue to provide continuity in education as well as be a resource uh, for businesses, uh, academic partners, and, and you in the community. Um, so we will have, uh, please check our website for some upcoming programs that will uh, assist you during these most challenging times. Uh, okay, first, yes. you're gonna go right into it now. It's all Excellent. up to you. Great, great. so uh, what I would like to do is introduce our panelists for today, and then I will ask them to spend approximately three to five minutes sharing their story uh, with each of us. Uh, describing their business, um, how long they've been around, what their business uh, climate looked like prior to the pandemic, and um, how their business has been impacted, and some best practices uh, and challenges that they've also learned during this experience. Uh, so in no particular order, I would like to uh, welcome Brian Fairbank uh, of Fairbank Group, Mitch Nash of Blue Q, Nathan Wynn Stanley of Wynn Stanley Group, Tina Packard and Alan Burroughs of Shakespeare and Company, and last but certainly not least, Stephen Boyd of Boyd Technologies. Um, I will go based on the order of introductions and, and uh, reach out to our panelists uh, for an introduction. Uh, Brian, if you would start us, please. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I've been at Jiminy Peak for 51 winters. I know I don't look that old, but just the same. Um, and I never ever thought we'd see the kind of challenge we've had. You know, we've grown the business over a long period of time. We sleep, you know, 2,500 people here now, and we see a couple hundred thousand people in a, in a reasonable winter. Um, this winter was not a great winter. We had 26 days of rain. And when you have that much rain, it not only hurts that day, it hurts the next day because you need to recover from it. It's not like a golf course when the sun comes out, away you go. And so when this hit in March, we were coming out of a winter that was like, okay, we got to weather a financial storm as a result of the winter. Had the uh, uh, virus come out a month earlier, our entire industry would probably be on bended knee at this point in time. So if there's any goodness out of it for us was the timing in that we were at the tail end of our season and still had a month to go, but they aren't the, the most productive months. What we did very quickly is we furloughed uh, 52 people uh, we have two other mountains in, in uh, New England. One is Cranmore up in North Conway, Bromley in Southern Vermont. All three mountains curtailed uh, two thirds of their year round staff. 
We knew that we were going to go through a period of at least a month, if not two months, of saying, what are we going to do with everybody? Because we couldn't open. We couldn't get into any kind of summer projects, uh, what projects we may have had. And so we chose to furlough people as opposed to lay them off because we really didn't want to lose the heartbeat of our organizations and have people see it as a severance. And the ability to furlough them allowed them to um, accrue some PTO time, help them to deal with their insurance while they pay their share, we pay our share. We pay 60% of the insurance for our, our employees. We are intending to bring them back on May 4th, which is a week from Monday. And lo and behold, that's got a whole nother undertaking in terms of employer responsibility. We are working, a, putting together a return to work uh, plan or guide to be able to say, okay, if you're coming back to work for us, which we expect you to do, you're gonna sign off on this return to work plan that all the responsibilities are also on the employee's shoulders to deal with social distancing, wearing a mask whenever you're close with somebody, washing your hands, doing other things. And so it's a whole new arena for us. We don't know whether we're gonna be able to get open for the summer. Our summer operations represents only about 10% of our business, but it's an important part of the business for us in the summer. And seeing what's happening to all the cultural attractions in Berkshire County doesn't help us either. And uh, so we are walking down a path that we never walked down before. I don't know what the outcome is going to be in terms of uh, when we bring people back, are we able to keep them busy enough for two months? We are allowed to keep them busy as long as we're maintaining our asset. And so we're putting lots of people with paintbrushes in their hands and things they normally wouldn't have had to say, hey, we're here to protect our asset. Excellent. Well, Dwight, thank you, Brian. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, next, we have Mitch Nass with Blue Q. Mitch, would you mind sharing some of the challenges your organization is facing and how you're overcoming them? Um, stores are closed. Orders dried up. Um, went from zero to 60 in just a matter of days. Um, and, you know, Blue Q has been around for 31 years. We're a gift company. We, we do luckily sell these small, affordable pleasures that people can still buy over the internet. Like maybe you touched your genitals, hand sanitizer in our fun stocks that you may be familiar with and that kind of stuff. Um, so, um, but we, we have 60 people on staff. 10 of them are employed through Berkshire County AARC. So we have a team of individuals with disabilities who also work in production. They're all gone. The warehouses, the uh, office is all working remotely. But uh, some web orders have continued to come in the door. Um, so we've put a ton of emphasis on our website. And... Um, but when things hit, uh, my brother and I decided we would um, not lay anyone, anyone off, not furlough, wait and see what the government's assistance programs shaped up to be. Uh, we knew they were coming. We were able to keep the payroll going, uh, applied for the PPP plan, uh, did get our application approved. Um, Greylock was incredibly helpful to us in doing that. They were just um, really on it. So we now have eight weeks additional um, breathing room. Um, and um, th so the warehouse is operating with a skeleton crew. The one thing I think we've really just spent a ton of time on is just like keeping our company culture intact. We've got like long email threads that everyone is part of. Um, we've been um, feeding people, we've got we've got tons of excess employee time. So we've been farming out some projects people can do at home. We've got employees involved in some little research and development and writing tasks. Um, our our main focus is really just keeping the company the company communicating and trying to trying to beat the news cycle and um, keep everyone elevated. Uh, emotionally, I mean, we've got this great team, and um, and 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 their spirit is really um, just our our greatest treasure. So um, the guys have really just really risen to the challenge, and we're managing. We had 
we did, we've been, uh, like I said, promoting the web a lot. We, we did a huge giveaway of, um, of um, things on sell down. We got like 6,000 orders over the weekend. It's a drop in the bucket, but we're just looking for those small signals that we can all build on and stay optimistic. Excellent. Uh, we look forward to learning more about your internal and external communication strategies. For those, I, I, I'm sure uh, most, or if not all, know uh, the nature of your business, but can you just quickly describe uh, your line of business? So Blue Q is a gift manufacturer, so we make um, like um, gifty things. We have a line of probably 200 decorative socks. We make chewing gum, um, recycled bags with awesome graphics on them, um, dish towels, oven mitts, all, all very graphic and with, um, and very wordy, kind of lippy. Our average price point is probably about $10 or 10 or $12. So there's about three or 400 items in our line at any given time, primarily sold through specialty retail shops. Thank you, Mitch. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, next, we have uh, Nathan Winstanley from Winstanley Group. Uh, Nathan, if you would please give us uh, a brief background of your company, um, some of the challenges you're currently facing, and uh, how you're approaching them. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I came to the Berkshires in, I, I think, 1979, actually, as a high school English teacher at the DeSisto School. And through a uh, strange assortment of luck and opportunity uh, managed to uh, work my way through let's see I worked for the uh, Institute the uh, Economic Institute down in Great Barrington I worked uh, for a public relations agency I worked for GE and then put up my own shingle probably in the early 80s ran a uh, marketing and advertising firm until three years ago when I uh, retired, semi-retired, uh, and in the past three years, I've been working as a consultant with a lot of uh, private equity firms, and also I'm engaged in a large real estate uh, development project in the center of Lenox. So in, in terms of what's happened since uh, the coronavirus hit, my consulting work has slowed considerably uh, and uh, the real estate project, I have ongoing conversations with a couple of developers, but the fact of the matter is, you know, everybody is just sitting and holding and, and holding tight. Um, just as sort of an observation, I think, um, when I look at the panelists, and I think that this is something cool about Berkshire County and the Berkshire County uh, environment, um, you know, Brian was a client, uh, Tina was a client, and I was a board member with her back in the day. Uh, Stephen Boyd was a client. Mitch Nash, although never a client, uh, is a very close friend. And ever since uh, my son and his daughter were high school sweethearts many years ago. So um, I think one of the nice things about the economy here uh, really is, is that, you know, we do know all each other. Um, and I think that that's probably one of the things that whenever something does break and we return to some sort of new normal, um, I think that's going to be valuable for uh, going forward. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Tina Packer and Alan Burroughs with Shakespeare and Company. Who would please tell us a little a bit uh, about what the climate looked like uh, before this pandemic at Shakespeare and Company, some of the challenges you're currently facing, and uh, how you plan on uh, addressing these challenges going forward? So, Kevin, I'm going to do the very first bit, and then I'm going to hand it over to Alan because he's doing all the rescue work. So, very well. um, thank you, Tina. <laughs> uh, uh, we're 45 years old or thereabout. I can hardly believe it. You know, it feels like no time at all. Uh, we began with three and a half thousand dollars in the bank. We're obviously a theater company that has Shakespeare at the center and we've always been passionate about that. But it, it isn't just that we perform in the summer, which is where the public sees us most is that we do these, um, the, the center of our aesthetic is a certain kind of training 
So we're training people all the way through the year and our lead actors become teachers. And so we're passing on knowledge. And then of course, we do this vast education program and we're missing all of those. So all the summer programs are gone. We're hoping, fingers crossed, that the fall festival of Shakespeare, which is the 10 schools in Berkshire County that all do Shakespeare plays and then come together, will still be able to do that. That's, uh, that's where we're aiming for. But I just wanna say hardship is no, as Nate knows, hardship is no, um, foreigner to us, you know, being an arts organization, we've had lots of dodgy moments in our time and we have always survived them. And I have to say, one of the things that made me really take a pause was my God, you know, we've, we've survived all the things we've survived over the 45 years and, uh, you know, rode on the back of the tiger and we're gonna be done in by a virus? You know, it just, it really made me pause. But let me hand over to Alan so that he can tell you all the things that he and the team are doing, which is terrific. They're doing fantastic work. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Tina. I, um, I've been artistic director here about three years. I've been associated with the company about 30 years um, off and on. And um, so uh, what we initiated right away, we've been, I closed the office about um, five weeks ago, um, uh, buttoned everything up on uh, March 17th. And uh, I guess the imperative has been for us um, to stay connected with each other. We normally do, you know, a couple staff meetings a week. We ramp them up to every day. Um, so that we could check in with our staff individually and find out how they were doing both uh, in a disconnected way, but also how they could take the opportunity to reassess uh, what it is that they do. I, um, you know, we normally work kind of as a metaphor from opening night backwards and we have a, you know, very proactive high energy staff that's used to having their tasks in front of them and getting to it. And uh, so, you know, it took a real uh, internal adjustment for people personally, but also on an organizational level. So really, uh, it's also been uh, making sure that everyone stays informed uh, with all the information that's coming from the experts uh, and trying not to get too caught up in um, the politicization of this um, virus and the back and forth and taking that information and really forecasting what we can do. We were fortunate to uh, apply early and fast for the SBA loan and we, we did get that. So that gave us some breathing room both to assess how it is we work and um, if we uh, have to furlough people down the road, say the end of June, um, then we will have done the groundwork that is necessary to reopen uh, in the early fall because that is that's really what it's about is the, those two approaches. Um, really, you know, we're aiming to have our fall festival of Shakespeare because that's 10 high schools that come together and it's a huge community event uh, here on the property. If we can't do it in reality, we'll do it virtually somehow. Um, if we're not allowed to gather, uh, as well as our uh, fundraising gala on October 10th. For us right now, it's a health issue. Uh, and first and foremost, and we're looking at the economics of it, but really it's about how do we um, stay set, stable, plan for the future to be viable uh, down the road, but uh, really taking care of each other and uh, recognizing that we're, you know, part of this community and, and how do we continue to give back. So that's kind of where we are. Um, we, we haven't really assessed what it would be, you know, we, we, what we did was we postponed this season in its entirety to next year. We had Christopher Lloyd coming to play King Lear for us. We had our whole program. We, we had really robust uh, pre-sales for the summer. And uh, so I wanted to preserve the integrity of that programming and move it. If something comes up and we get a window where we can perform again, say in late summer, then we will definitely ramp up some programming and so that we can all celebrate being able to gather again. But that's what we do here. We gather. We're, you know, uh, theater is community. And, um, and so that's, uh, that's what we're bracing for, the long haul, really. 
Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, before we uh, move on with the introduction of our other distinguished guests, we do encourage you to post uh, questions that you have uh, in the Zoom webinar chat uh, so that they are in queue. So after um, the introduction of our, our members, uh, our faculty, I'm sorry, our panelists, we can go ahead and address some of your questions. Uh, next up, we have Stephen Boyd um, of Boyd Technologies, CEO of Boyd Technologies and chairman of the um, board for the Berkshire Innovation Center. Good morning, Stephen. How are you? Good morning. Thanks Good. for uh, having me, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, I think just maybe in, um, in brief for audience members who don't know, um, Boyd Technologies is a contract design and manufacturing organization. Um, so I, I always think show and tell is a little bit easier, but we, we are uh, hired to make uh, things like diagnostic strips and, um, and wound care dressings. And if you can see this in my, uh, with my virtual background. And of course, we are um, also pivoting to um, the manufacturing of some uh, PPE and other products in the, uh, in the space. So we are ruled um, an essential business, uh, both for our existing customers and for the work that we're doing to address the crisis right now. Um, and so it presents to us, uh, I guess, a slightly different uh, set of concerns um, as we uh, continue operations. We're actually uh, quite busy right now. Uh, and, and we think that some of our business may have lagging effects to the crisis. So not all of um, the work, we're, not all of our customers are, are um, busy. We have uh, filters that are made uh, to help uh, uh, purify things like milk and orange juice. And you've seen the news about the American dairy um, farmers right now. So we're, uh, we're ever aware of what the future might hold. And I, and I think that's um, the way that we're approaching everything right now. Um, is in this kind of multi-dimensional approach. We're, we're trying to think about today and tomorrow and the here and now, but also what does next month and this summer look like, or what is, the, what is the new normal going to be? And at the same time, we're trying to think about multiple levels of probability. Is it likely? Is it possible? Is it um, uh, a could be or probably not? Are, are the sort of factors that we're putting into uh, the way that we try to make decisions in, in um, the way that we're running the business. And then we're trying to be ever communicative with our staff who uh, has mixed, uh, mixed feelings about uh, being ruled essential. They're, they're of course very happy to have employment in their jobs. And I'm honored to have the staff that I do. Um, I'm really proud of them, and I'm, uh, I'm I feel very lucky um, to work with the people that I do. Uh, but some of them are also really anxious about the fact that they have to get up and come into work every day. And so we've tried very hard to um, increase cleaning protocols and sanitize the facility. And um, again, we're on a regular pre-COVID basis, we're trained to move um, in and out of clean rooms and controlled spaces in ways that prevent cross-contamination. And so we've ramped that to the next level and, and tried to treat the entire facility like it's a clean room um, so that people can feel safe uh, in what we, we, we think of as a sanctuary uh, in terms of the facility. Um, you know, Mitch, one, one dinner you and I had uh, with a, a group of colleagues, you talked about Blue Q um, having a culture of beginnership. And I think about that a lot. Um, I, I've, I've stolen that uh, from you. And, and I think that because I think it's a wonderful way of um, in, in pre-COVID times sort of promoting perpetual curiosity and lifelong learning but I think it's also uh, relevant in, in today's world because this is unprecedented, right? We're all beginners in this. And so, um, yeah, we're trying to put one foot in front of the other and, um, and we're doing the same thing at the Berkshire Innovation Center. That, uh, well, before I go there, I guess I would say we are um, trying to balance the engineering and administrative work at Boyd Technologies with work from home protocols. But as a manufacturer, uh, we make stuff 
that needs to be tested or put together at the facility. So it's a, a bit challenging. Uh, I'm at home at my dining room table now, um, as are other engineers and, and administrators, but for the most part, we're getting to a place where more and more of us need to be in the facility with the rest of our operations team to continue to uh, support the, the critical supply of these products that we're um, sending to customers in, in the healthcare space. Um, the Berkshire Innovation Center um, shut its um, shut its doors for um, you know one of its major um, values was the ability to create a, a maker space, a collaborative space to come together. And so the staff has worked really hard to pivot the value of collaboration through distance learning and doing um, things like we're doing right now. Um, it has actually had an opportunity to work um, on some specific PPE related projects, which again, I'm happy to talk about a little bit later, but um, I think similar to all of us, they're working hard to pivot um, toward, toward being relevant and um, providing value uh, so that they've, they've 3D printed a respirator for the fire department in um, Pittsfield and they're working with one of our member organizations that has a pop-up room that basically uh, is a suitcase sized uh, um, package, weighs a little bit under 100 pounds, but uh, um, basically make becomes a, a temporary hospital room. Um, and so uh, they're using 3D printing and uh, reverse engineering to provide additional services to our members in a way that they can continue to, uh, to try to drive their businesses. Excellent, well, thank you, Stephen. We look forward to uh, more questions related to uh, your business and your area of expertise. Uh, next, I, I uh, throw us back to uh, Deb, who will introduce our special guest. Yeah, um, I, I am completely blown away. You should see the notes I have from what yeah. all of you said. Um, Tina, I think you win the award though. We've had a lot of dodgy moments and we've always survived. I, I, I wanna just make that my motto. I thought that was great. <laughs> and I loved how you said it with your English accent. So that was wonderful. Um, uh, we have a special guest who's not one of the standard panelists, but I wanted to include, and um, I'm gonna make him buy us all a cup of coffee too, is Ben Lamb, who's the Director of Economic Development from One Berkshire. And he and I have talked, I think almost every day through this, including the fact that he provided my household with sourdough starters. So there's all kinds of really good baking going on here as well. But um, Ben has his finger on the pulse of a bigger picture, what's going on regionally with businesses and also what's going on with the new government programs. He and I did one webinar a while ago about the PPP and the EIDL when no one knew what those stood for. And then of course they ran out of money but there they have new tranches of them. I just wanted to give Ben a moment or two, like we did with the panelists, to sort of give us his impression of what's going on and how people are coping before we go to the questions. So Ben, you're up. Great, uh, thank you, Deborah, and thank you to everyone. This has been uh, enlightening as well for us, um, or for myself anyway. Uh, you know, I think one of the interesting things about this whole dynamic, and this is kind of a big picture piece, is that everything's changing day by day. Um, you know, it, whether it's national policy or it's regional efforts or it's just individual businesses. I mean, the, the uh, webinar that me and Deborah did um, just a little over a week ago now um, is pretty heavily outdated um, because of how everything changes so rapidly. So uh, I think having these sorts of conversations is really helpful. Um, but from uh, sort of the one Berkshire angle, there's, there's a lot of moving parts here, uh, as everyone might assume. Um, we, you know, the SBA program, all of that's been pretty heavily in the media. So everyone knows that, uh, you know, there was a launch of a, a very large amount of money that was spent very quickly. Um, some efforts now to refill that pot. But I think um, one of the, the kind of big picture pieces that we're experiencing now is some anxiety that's uh, being uh, driven by uh, that program sort of hitting a wall. Um, but also the, uh, one of the interesting things here in the Berkshires is that we're really good about circling the wagons. So uh, whether it's the, the banks really rising to the occasion, the local banks are supporting businesses as best they can. Um, so we're continuing to tell people to go to their financial institutions and then start the conversation, even if um, the loan programs aren't currently accepting new applications. Um, and we're seeing those conversations being fruitful for folks. 
Uh, we're also seeing it in you know, the retail and uh, food services side of things. Um, you know, when food services had to pivot, you know, being from, you know, you go and you sit in a restaurant to being entirely a takeout or a delivery opportunity, um, we, we've seen a lot of people uh, rally around their local restaurants and continuing to purchase from them as best they can uh, during this time, which has been uh, is basically keeping those businesses alive. Uh, and so that's been a really helpful uh, kind of pivot that we've noted. Um, the other thing too, and I know Mitch, you, you live in this realm of e-commerce and uh, we've seen a lot of uh, small businesses that have never been e-commerce uh, businesses pivoting to platforms in order to sustain their continuity uh, both now and then going forward. Uh, and so across all of this, I think one of the biggest pieces is, is yes, money is in, extremely important when it comes from um, the SBA or other grant programs because there's been a lot of small ones that have popped up um, and been spent just as quickly as they popped up. Uh, but the other side of this too is that uh, we're seeing a lot of businesses that are now seeking technical assistance that they've never uh, had to seek out before. So whether that's uh, you know getting new accountants uh, to support their operations, to rebuild their business model, to look at e-commerce, to move to more digital interfacing, uh, you know, to just having a delivery driver when they've never done deliveries before, um, all of those pieces have really, uh, I think, the reality of the need for them to pivot for the new economy that not just right now, but that's going to be the new economy going forward. Um, that's become uh, or is becoming a more dynamic conversation. And I think as we go forward, um, that's going to continue to need to shift and there's going to be a, a demand for uh, further technical assistance to get people primed to um, both apply for funds as they become available, so being shovel ready, um, but then also being ready to have their business be as agile and resilient as possible, um, both now and in the future. So that's been really kind of from our angle, a lot of the uh, consultations that we're seeing, a lot of the incoming calls and stuff like that uh, has really been around that. Um, interestingly enough, we are seeing new businesses that are uh, working on developing right now in the Berkshires. Uh, so you know, none of those that I can share right now, but we've had um, at least a handful of folks approach us that are interested in starting new businesses, some that are driven by the coronavirus uh, pandemic, where they're seeing an opportunity to meet market demand, um, but then others that were already uh, you know, a brainchild that is now starting to get some traction and they want to move forward. So um, while I would say absolutely the, there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of um, changing tides every day, every hour. Uh, there is, you know, at, at some points in that uh, vein, some um, some signs of hope where people are still aspiring to bring their businesses to fruition. Well, we sure hope so because we have a pitch contest on May 13th. So we hope we have full participation. Thank you, Ben. And we will circle back to you because I know one Berkshire is on top of all of these changes and you have some resources that you want to share at the end. So Kevin, let's um, quickly move to some questions. Sure. I know that there are a few in the chat and why don't you start? We'll call on each panelist to answer in turn so we don't all talk over each other. Sure, there are actually uh, another few that were previously submitted uh, prior to the uh, commencement of, of the webinar. We did have somebody ask, uh, are there business practices that you had not um, uh, uh, adopted prior to COVID-19 that you will continue to adopt uh, because you, you, you feel that they are beneficial to your organization? Uh, an unexpected benefit of, of um, either telecommuting or teleworking. Who would you like to ask that of? Uh, uh, Stephen Boyd. Um, I guess, is there a silver lining or any practices or, or lessons learned from this that businesses or, or your business uh, will carry over going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are, um, I think everyone's seeing how effective Zoom calls can be. And, and um, I've been um, on, on calls of this size and calls that have 50 or 60 people. Um, and I've been surprised at how effective they have um, been. Um, I'm not sure. I'm a. Uh, um, I really like to pat people on the back and shake their hands, mm -hmm. and uh, that's something I'm missing and grieving to be just sort of personal about it. Uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to do that again with a stranger that I've just met. Um, uh, we do a lot of work with with um, with Japan, and so. Uh, not trying to be cheeky here, but we do actually bow in some of our meetings. And so I think, you know, whether it's the elbow bump or the foot bump or bowing, I think 
there's a um, a new normal as it relates to greeting. Certainly in the mid midterm, I, I hope we come back to shaking hands and and uh, you know I can give a bunch of hugs to all you guys soon. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I think it's probably the most the most for us it would be um, finding ways to allow for more work from home opportunities. Um, there's a real broad range of people who are very effective at that and others who I think might drift a little bit. So uh, something to, Thanks, to come Steven. back to. I'm going to field the next one and I want to send it to Tina and Alan of Shakespeare and Company because it ties into what you just said, which is um, who wants to be the first one to start a gathering again? Don't you think people will be nervous? I mean, let's say you guys get the all clear in May or June and people can go outside. Do you, are you worried about bringing people together? I, I think that, um, well, what do you think, Dean? I'll let you go and then I'll bring <laughs> you. No, I think, I think one of the things about Shakespeare and Company is we perform outdoors often. So in my fantasy, what we'll do is we'll do one of the plays which we can range all over the place. We'll actually traverse the the whole property, you know, we have uh, how many, 25 acres here, so that we actually 32. would devise a play that we would play, you know, that little bit would be over in that woods there, and then the audience would walk somewhere else, and we'd do another little bit over here, and then we'd go into the parking lot and do another little bit there. Do you know what I mean? So that every, the audience could choose their distancing and everybody could have their masks on, but we also, and we'd obviously limit it but, uh, to the amount of people that would be there. But we, and because we were live, we could, you know, and because Shakespeare did this all the time, we could improvise uh, with shrieks, yells, and general instructions if everybody was getting too close. <laughs> or send it up, tease, or do, do you know what I mean? That it would be a really lovely challenge. So, you know, I'd, I'd be all up for that. And um, I suppose you'd call it the art of rough theatre. Uh, but I do think it's something that we could do. Uh, but it wouldn't be conventional theatre. I don't know. I, what uh, do you I'm also that? working on um, a drive in Shakespeare idea where people can come onto the property in their cars. And I'm, I'm really giving this away. I hope no one steals it from this panel, but uh, not you guys. I trust you guys not to steal it. But uh, <laughs> basically, yeah, I ordered an FM transmitter so people could drive in the property, <clears throat> stay in their cars, and we could broadcast right into their cars. Like a drive-in uh, drive like movie. Like a drive-in movie. You tune yeah. in your car drive radio, in <laughs> and then we do it live, and then um, their feet never have to touch the ground. So. Um, but in the interim, it's really about, um, you know, assessing what, what we can do. Can we do, we're, we're trained to speak uh, clearly and to be understood outdoors. We used to be down at the Mount at Edith Wharton's estate and uh, we didn't mic ourselves then. So we're, we're used to being heard. And uh, if we can do that and monetize it in a way that we can get enough people to gather where, um, you know, we can stay viable, then that's what we'll do. But really it's about the spirit of it. You know, uh, I think it was Stephen who said, um, or maybe it was Mitch who said, you know, um, you know, that he's got great spirit in his company. And, and that's what we, you know, that's our stock and trade as is, is, is the spirit of the individual here. So that's what we're, um, you know, that's what we're banking on kind of rolling out when we do come back, when we do get the all clear. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, next, we have a, a uh, question from Julie Hannum from Berkshire Community College. Uh, this question I, I will throw out to Brian or Nathan. Uh, she's interested in hearing details about, um, in particular, uh, Brian's back to work plan. Uh, so uh, Brian, if you'd like to comment on that or and Nathan, if you want to add uh, your input as well. Um, once the governor uh, announces that uh, the, the state is reopened and we can go back, what, what would that look like for you? Will all employees come back at the same time or will you gradually migrate folks back? So back to work plan is one that we are assembling all kinds of information that's from OSHA and what do they have to offer um, EEOC and what do they have to offer our own practical examples of what 
we need to deal with where do people punch in and do they punch in or do we go to remote you know methods of having people uh, uh, punch in with their phones uh, what do we do about lunches and what do we do about lunches in terms of historically we had several kitchens around the property I should say refrigerators well we don't believe that we can commingle you know people's lunches in that refrigerator so we're probably going to require all employees to bring their own cooler with some ice packs in it to say okay where do you feed them where do you let them take lunch and we can fortunately because we're dormant now and we have all kinds of meeting room space we can assign one room that can keep people 10 or 15 feet away from each other for all the housekeepers we can do another space for all the mountain operations people and so those are all the types of things that we've had to work into this what are we going to do with temperature checks and how often are we going to do them and we haven't resolved what responsibility we take there but you get scared to death about putting stuff in writing <clears throat> that if you don't live up to it are you going to get sued later and so it really is a fine line of saying what do we do we have all three mountains working on it collaboratively to say can we come up with a brief three-page document if you go to osha's document it's 34 pages long i don't expect our employees to pay attention to a you know 30 page document so we've somehow got to get really concise in terms of here's what we expect from you here's what you expect from us and we're going to ask for a sign off from everybody that they've read it and they understood it excellent thank you um okay i want to uh, share Alyssa costa's question because Alyssa, i think this is a really important one are you finding that your employees now furloughed or not are in need of extra support and connection to services beyond the typical hr department mental health social services supports that you never had to provide before i'm going to ask mitch this i know that you have your employees and you're trying to keep them on um, are and you're also trying to keep the culture going best you can with things like an email thread but how do you deal with the anxiety and the i'm in a full house and i'm teaching my kids at the same time and all of the rest of that that's going on well um that, that's a great question we've given everyone with kids at home the opportunity to not work and stay on the payroll because they all have brand new jobs really homeschooling or just having the responsibility of, of being home um but quite a few um employees with younger with families with younger children uh have had a spouse who can take up the slack but we we have um we, we very graciously and sincerely just offer to we're not really asking questions it's like we're we're giving people a bit of personal space um if you um if you're in that situation or you're caring for a parent or whatever that's totally okay, okay. Um, in, in terms of like other other the other support elements that you asked about i, I can't think of anything that's um yet become relevant to us do any of the other panelists have things that, that they've added to their support for their employees or, or things that they've heard about that you want to talk about? I, I think I think you bring up a really good point about, um, you know, um, checking in with people's mental health around this. I know that a lot of us actually got um, exponentially more busy as we tried to make a plan. You know, I think um, some of us are on Zoom calls six, seven hours a day, really. If I have to look at a, you know, it totally cuts into my Netflix habit. And, um, and uh, you know, we have a lot, you know, people say, well, what are you putting out for content? And for us, the, the rush to content is, is really kind of an expression of some energy. And I think that's really valiant. Um, but you know, we want to take it slowly, especially given the fact that it's all new territory for our staff. One thing that I found in terms of making the decision was a you know making certain set decisions was a great relief for the staff because it gave them something to wrap their heads around rather than hanging in limbo and not knowing what was next as we try to work within the limitations that have been imposed on us and the parameters that have kind of come down with the restrictions. And so 
saying, you know, th these are identifying what the, what the parameters are and saying, this is what we can work with. These are the decisions that are going to be made. And, uh, and this is what we, uh, what we can do productively because all your organizations like ours have, you know, a very productive people and they, they, they want to produce, they want to, they want to do something. They're not used to waiting around. Great. Thank you. Kevin. Excellent. Uh, we have a question from Audrey Sussman, and uh, I, I, I will paraphrase it, but uh, due to attrition or, you know, potential loss of employees, um, is there any type of education or workforce development training that can be provided in order to help support your businesses um, and, and make uh, candidates more attractive um, to you? Do you want to ask that to a specific person? Uh, I think uh, that was to all panelists. So if, any, if uh, anyone wants to weigh in on that. I guess no one does. I guess no one. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we we will go to the next question, uh, Deb. Well, yeah. I, 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 do you I'll, want I'll just I'll offer that I think that um, you know everyone has specific hard skills that they need for their business, whether it's um, mechanical engineering or it's um, deep historical knowledge of of Shakespearean literature. I think that there are the sort of job specific um, competencies and skills that are in, in, in some ways not going to change. Obviously, there's a real need for technical proficiency in, in my business, both for distance communications now, but also generally for what we do. I, I also think that those sort of soft skills, behavioral anchors, uh, we, just, we just talked about social and emotional well-being. And, um, I hesitated to jump in, but certainly we're trying to think about it. I am, um, I'm, I go to a place where I want lots of, um, I, I'm a big believer in collective wisdom, right? And so I want a lot of information and I want it from a ton of diverse sources so that I can try to ground myself in, um, in reality and then um, manage my own, um, you know, uh, keep my emotional feet underneath me and not like panic when you read something uh, conspiracy theorist like on Facebook. Um, but I, I think that um, the ability to communicate well, the ability to work in teams, to connect with people, um, to, to have a growth mindset, I think those are all really, really essential soft skills that young iGen and millennial folks need to continue to, um, to hone. And it's something that as our um, community educator, um, I think that the college could provide or, or continue to support. Thank you, Stephen. I, I wanna um, go to Nathan Win Stanley for this one, because I think as a guy who ran a marketing and advertising agency for a lot of years and a person who's been here a long time, you have some perspective is, how do we as business owners, operators, nonprofit people, keep in touch with our consumers and our customers and our potential customers to stay engaged with them. I actually saw a really funny um, thing in the Berkshire uh, Eagle this morning, I don't know if any of you saw it, about the first line of all the emails. We know what you're going through. I mean, they're all so trite and, and hackneyed and awful, but you want to show that you genuinely care about the people who you are connected to and hopefully will be buying from you again. How do you do that in this? I actually work for two different, or consult with two different marketing firms, one in New York and one in Springfield. It's, you know, it's a scramble. Um, I think uh, everybody is trying to find a formula that, um, keeps them in front of their customers' eyes. And yet, you know, there's, I think, an understanding that the world is essentially different. Uh, with one of the uh, principles of the agency that I'm working with in New York, you know, we talked about things like, you know, the, that, you know, we think that afterwards, you know, authenticity is, authenticity is going to be a really important part of, um, you know, the profile that you give to your customers. And it's going to be about, you know, people are going to be wary and they're going to be looking for, you know, some certainty. And, you know, 
again, because there's just so much that has to happen and because there really is no vision of what comes next, how you position yourself, I think, is going to be just critically important because you're going to, it's going to, you're going to have to adopt, you know, you're going to have to be adaptive and all that. I mean, you know, everybody that is on the panel is, you know, it, it, for obvious reasons as an entrepreneur. And the one thing you learn about entrepreneurship is, is that, you know, the, you know, the, the weather always changes out at sea and you always have to be ready to make a move. And I think what's happening, you know, and I see it with the real estate developers I'm working with, I see it with the private equity guys I talk to, everybody's sort of waiting and seeing what's going to happen. But by the, at the same time, everybody is also trying to decide, you know, is there going to be a fundamental difference in the way that you go to market? What are going to be the elements of those things that are going to be critical to it? And then, you know, how are you going to execute on that? And, you know, I, I, I really believe that, you know, um, sincerity, authenticity, those kinds of things are just going to be increasingly more important. And I think that, you know, you may see, price become less of an issue and value become more of a, a desirable attribute. You know, so, the, you know, and ultimately the question becomes, you know, the real estate guys are, you know, is this going to be great for us or is this going to be terrible for us in the Berkshires? And they have no idea. And so everybody's just kind of sitting and, and weaving alternative points of view and hoping that some of what they come up with is going to be valuable to them whenever we come out of the other side of this. Great. Do any of the other panelists want to comment on that authenticity and, and messaging? Uh, I don't. I don't need to comment on authenticity, but I, I do applaud Nate for throwing in a nautical metaphor in there, and, uh, <laughs> and and you, Deborah, for using the word hackneyed, which I'm pretty sure is a word Shakespeare invented. So, <laughs> thank you. I, um, I would we, just. I would just quickly ahead. say that I think that um, so often you hear about inbound marketing and the big shift being that people no longer want to be told what to like, they want to be heard. And I think that's what, you know, Nate is touching on is, and, 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 and part of the challenge is everyone's sort of holding back and waiting right now. But I think if we as businesses spend a lot of time listening to our customers, um, new values and new opportunities will start to show themselves. I know this is crazy. It's 9.55 already. I need to wrap us up because these wonderful people have all committed an hour and Alan's whole schedule is filled with Zoom meetings. So he probably has to leave right at 10. Um, I'm going first to Ben to just talk about how people can find out what help is available from one Berkshire. Then Kevin is going to hand it off to each panelist to sort of give us a parting thought. So there you go. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you all. This was fantastic. Um, so One Berkshire, really, as soon as everything uh, began with COVID-19, we really pivoted to being as much of a COVID response agency as possible. Um, so I would say that one of the biggest resources we have is our web presence. Um, so if you go to oneberkshire.com now, the entire platform has really been evolved to address as many needs as possible, whether those are personal, professional, um, or otherwise. So um, if you head to oneberkshire.com, we actually have a COVID response page. Um, that has a toolbox. Um, you know, traditionally, a lot of our materials have been more member-based, um, but we've really shifted to being everything for everyone. Um, so as much as we can possibly support the economic ecosystem here, um, we've really tried to open source as many resources as we can. Um, so there's, we literally update that one, two, three times a day um, with materials that come in and also removing outdated materials so that the, the system is really staying as primed as possible to be as user-friendly. Um, so and that's you're also update. doing the town halls, right? That was the next piece I was going to say. So the, the next thing that we started, and we did one last week, is we were holding a town hall series. Um, we had one last week on the visitor economy, which is posted on our website now. Um, this week, we're actually considering this, our, our town hall presence. Um, but next week, we'll continue with a, a weekly uh, slated town hall series that'll pivot and be as agile as possible to meet immediate demands. So uh, those programs are really meant to fill the niche in the dialogue that we're not seeing elsewhere and especially targeted towards the Berkshires. So um, the last thing I'll say is that the jobs thing, which is our jobs portal, there are people that are still hiring right now. So we do continue to keep that updated. We've had at least 15 positions in the last two weeks that have been posted. So, um, you know, continuing to keep that engine primed as well, because the reality is there are still uh, employers seeking employees at this time. Thank you, Ben. 
Kevin? Excellent. Uh, so I will ask uh, for closing remarks and I will try to sneak in some uh, 30 second uh, questions uh, that were asked from our folks. So um, uh, Brian Fairbank, uh, Fairbank Group, uh, if you give some closing remarks and do you have any advice um, or, or can you articulate quickly what your plans would be if this uh, quarantine continues? Wow. Um, that's, <laughs> 30 uh, that's, seconds, uh, go. I got 30 <laughs> seconds, seconds, okay. Um, you know, we are, we are, because we're a seasonal business, we're trying to look at saying, what if we can't open this summer? What if it's impossible? What are the financial ramifications of that happening? And the reality of it, what if no, nobody comes to stay in our hotel uh, or condominium rooms in terms of what we do? And we haven't, that's such an ugly picture we haven't really come to a conclusion as to what that would do. We financially started to analyze it, but psychologically we haven't addressed it because we recognize if this continues on for another three or four months, not only are we going to you know, be frustrated being homebound, but we're gonna be frustrated with the entire situation. Excellent, thank you. Mitch Nass from Blue Q. Well, I've always, the thing that's, the thing that's always fascinated me about business is just business as an empathetic organization because it really is all about the little things and um, it's caring, caring, caring in every area um, and caring about people, caring about your customers and um, and, and that, that, that's the real currency, I think, in every successful business. So you can't really go wrong by, by, by just being empathetic to, everything's an empathy opportunity to us. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, next, uh, Nathan Winstanley from Winstanley Group. Nathan, uh, could you also just weigh in? Somebody wants to know uh, your opinion on whether um, there'll be a, a focus now on broadband. Uh, internet uh, in the Berkshires as a result of COVID-19, but uh, I don't know if you want to um, give your opinion. I'm sorry, Nathan. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, if, if, uh, if you just want to uh, include your closing remarks, and I don't know if you want to address a question, whether you think that there will be a, a focus now on broadband in the Berkshires. I mean, I, you know, look, the investments, the economic investments that have been made, the, the major economic investments that have been made in the Berkshires over the, you know, the past several years um, are really about tourism. And um, I don't see, I mean, I think that has to, you know, that has to pattern out. We don't know, you know, I mean, think about Cranwell, you know, they just dumped ninety million dollars into it, and they haven't. You know, what are they going to do? I mean, that you know, there's, you know, that's a hundred. That's probably fifty to a hundred thousand people that may or may not come here. And I, you know, again, I think, you know, this is a time when there's a lot of alternative possibilities of what could happen. And until I think things, you know, show themselves one way or the other, I, I just don't know how you can really make assessments. I think you can make plans, but I think that you really have to be reactive at this point and just be smart and reactive at the same time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tina Packer from Shakespeare and Company. Well, um, I hope this isn't going to sound uh, careless of people's feelings, but what I found is that this is an incredible time to find out about stuff you never knew before. So in other words, I, I took the COVID virus and thought, okay, has this happened before? And the answer is yes. It was called the great mortality or the great plague. So I have learned an awful lot about when Europe practically closed down because of the, uh, because of the plague. And so the world has been here before. And I just think this idea of learning about things that you didn't know before, if you don't panic, about not having a job uh, is an incredible opportunity because it widens your horizons and you start thinking about things you hadn't thought of before. So I hope that doesn't sound, you know, careless of people's feeling, but I just think the opportunity to investigate other stuff is, is there. 
Thank you very much, Tina. Uh, next, Alan Burroughs from Shakespeare and Company. Yeah, there were two plagues in 1604 and 1606, and Shakespeare created a lot of amazing works after those plagues. It makes you wonder what kind of energy uh, was pent up inside of him uh, that burst forth afterwards, and were the you know the beneficiaries of that. I think back to um, it makes me think of my folks, and my dad who was in World War II, and um, the type of sacrifices that they made. Uh, for the long haul and what they realized they had to do as uh, a kind of a collective in order to get beyond something. Right now we're dealing with an invisible adversary uh, who takes people down tragically. And, um, and so it, it really is about reassessing um, so many things that are important to us. So that's kind of been my takeaway from it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Boyd of Boyd Technologies. Um, you know, I agree with so many of the things that have been said in terms of finding new mastery and opportunities to learn things. I think um, what I would say is I believe in uh, medical research and in um, the industry that we're participating in, and I've seen unbelievable amounts of resources dive into finding a cure and providing more testing. And I think it will take time. I don't want to be Pollyannish about this, but I think that we will um, we will beat this. And so I look forward to skiing at Jiminy Peak next winter. Um, I may have to pivot a little bit about how I take my goggles on and off, or who I or when I where I eat lunch. But I think that uh, for me, um, being ever vigilant and, and pragmatic about the reality of the challenges right now is important. But I also believe that there are parts of our ways of life that that will come back. I want to go to uh, to hear a sh uh, play about um, a Shakespearean play in my car. I think that's a wonderful idea and a cool pivot. So I guess my 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 last little closing remark is that word is used a lot, pivot. And so I think all of us have in us the ability to add some value and be a part of the new um, the new normal. And, and stay mission driven about that. You don't have to completely reinvent the world, even though it feels like that right now. I think one degree different than what we're doing now makes a huge difference in 365 days, right? It's a, a much larger deviation over time, but it's a choice of just one degree in the moment now. So. Thanks. I, I really enjoyed talking to all of you guys thank, today. Thank you, Stephen. I, I want to say I loved this panel and I wish we had more time and I know you all are busy. I still want to do the other panel, the how I built my business, because I think the origin stories are so interesting. So stay tuned. We'll hopefully do that in the fall. Entrepreneurship for All is all about these ideas and these opportunities and these pivots. And that's why I'm so glad that we were able to sponsor this in association with Berkshire Community College today. I'm gonna to remind you again, we're doing a pitch contest on May 13th that will be virtual. But if you know anyone with an idea or a pivot idea, that's okay too. We would love to have them. And if you thought this webinar was interesting, we do one every week on Wednesdays. So uh, check us out at eforall.org. Kevin, what's going on at BCC that you wanna remind everyone about? Yes, we have a, a lot of uh, upcoming uh, events. Uh, we, we're migrating, obviously, our uh, academic programs online uh, for summer one and summer two sessions. Uh, but we have some webinars. We want to provide resources for the community. We have a web webinar coming up on uh, May 6 at 11 a.m. It's called COVID-19, Supporting Families and Children. Uh, our guest speaker is Dr. Stephen Koza. He's a retired colonel and a professor of America's Medical School. He was responsible for the mental health response to um, the Pentagon attacks on September 11th. So he has a lot of great insight as far as what we can do to support our own families um, and, uh, and, and our children and uh, identify risks and some strategies. Um, so that's uh, May 6th at 11 a.m. All right, uh, so we are gonna wrap this up. Seven minutes late, sorry about that, guys. You were all terrific. The Berkshires is resilient. Tina Packer said it, we've had lots of dodgy moments. We're gonna get past this one too. Thank you to all the panelists, to Kevin of BCC, to Casey, who's a light bulb on our screen, but he really helped run the whole tech for this thing. This has been recorded and you can catch the recording. Um, I hope to hear your success stories in a month or two 
two months, three months, however far down there when we can put this all in our rear view mirror. Thank you, Thanks. everyone. Thanks. Thank Bye -bye. you.